Hello and welcome to Arita Rangetram episode 3. I want to apologize um on behalf of our production team for the delay in posting of this episode. We had some technical glitches during its production which has been fixed with editing later and hence the delay. Um this episode has been one of my favorites and most fun. We have with us a very joyful uh Joy's Paul Pursabahian Akka uh as a spe- guest on the show. Joy Saka is a student of the world renowned Leela Samson. Uh she learned from Leela Akka in Bharatiya Kala Kendra New Delhi. Um Joy Saka also has the distinction of doing a PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Delhi. Uh for her PhD studies she has studied dance injuries and biomechanics um of elite dancers of Kalakshetra where she spent some time studying them the effect dance has on their bodies. Joy Saka during her stay in Kalakshetra has learned from stalwarts like Janardhan and sir and later uh, professor CV Chandrasekhar sir she runs a dance school in Washington near Seattle and um routinely gives talks on dance injuries and biomechanics uh, so enjoy the show uh, and we all know Joy Saka through facebook so <laughs> hi Saka we are so pleased to have you on the show it uh, i think first madana Do you have a question for Joy Saka? Yes, so she kind of touched upon uh, your uh, research. So your thesis was about biomechanics and the different aspects and how it relates to uh, Bharatanatyam dancers, isn't it, Akka? Um, I I'll change it just a little bit. Um, actually, it was about uh, um, anthropometry, physiological mm-hmm. measurements, uh, physical and physiological measurements, fat deposition patterns, and injury patterns. and i chose to focus on elite dancers and because i was a bharatanatyam dancer it was it just seems natural to blend my anthropology and my bharatanatyam training into one and i i i think a lot of it goes to my supervisor dr satvanti kapoor who supported me and said there hasn't been a study in india on elite dancers so yours would be the first go ahead and do it we don't have precedence but you know we can go ahead and do it so so that's what it was Can can you tell us a little more about uh, your thesis and the different aspects of uh, biomechanics and, uh, and yes. how it relates to dance specifically? Yeah, actually, um, in my thesis, which was from ninety five ninety six, it was published way back in ninety five ninety six. Um, that was more on the somatotyping, the anthropometry, uh, the physiology. um and injury patterns the kinetics of body movement and the kinetics kinetics of uh, how adavas in bharatanatyam work with your physiology or work with your body structure or the body that you're blessed with is more of the work that i'm doing now and there's been a gap since my phd and my work now i took like about 12 to 15 years of break to do user experience research uh, for software um, in the it industry so i'm just getting back more into the kinetics part of it um and recently i did a talk in atlanta which was more about um kinetics of movement biomechanics of your body you know <clears throat> if your lower limbs are structured a certain way how would that help you when you sit in aramandi or for that matter not help you when you sit in aramandi or if your upper arms are structured a certain way <clears throat> how would you use compensatory techniques to work and so on and so forth so that's more of the work i'm doing now my phd uh, work was not very biomechanics or kinetics oriented it was more of anthro- anthropometry and physiology and um you know uh, more about more like sports fitness but for bharatanatyam uh-huh. dancers as as elite sports sports people so i can you are so familiar with bharatanatyam adavus in the steps we do and uh, you have this study so in layman's terms if i had to ask is there something in bharatanatyam that we do is like harmful to the body like you know, many people debate about whether aramandi is necessary uh, people debate about whether these things are really useful to the body or are they actually harmful because many people have injuries and stuff so can you tell us in like layman terms what is it that we are doing right and what is it that we should and shouldn't do i think injuries are part of life i mean human beings got injured even as neanderthals i mean they didn't i don't know if they danced but um injury is part of life and if you if you pick up any sport any physical activity it you could be an olympian you could be a track and field athlete you could be a dancer you could be skiing 
any any kind of activity artistic or sporty that you pick up will have injury as part of it because you're you're challenging your body to go beyond what it can normally do on a on a daily basis so given that i think injury is part of your life as a dancer but I think the goal of the dancer is to say, how can I reduce the number of injuries I get in my lifetime as a dancer? So if I start dancing at a particular age and I you know, continue my dancing career for 10 years, 15 years, whatever number of years, how can I make sure that I have the least number of injuries? Um, I, think, I think that's what you need to focus on. And I, I wouldn't say that um, any particular position is better or worse. Aramandi uh, especially is not a very natural position. Mm. It requires you to have a 180 degree turnout. And it's the same thing in ballet. If you sit in a demi plie, you're required to have a very nice pelvic turnout, which translates to a turnout in the knee and then translates to a turnout in, in your foot. And they're like, it's you're expecting your body to do something uh, at three different levels, at your pelvic level, at your knee level and at your foot level. And you, your body may not be designed, you know, uh, to do that efficiently. So yes, there are things that might cause, for example, you may be able to do an RMD really well, but I may not be. And if I push myself to try and be like you, although my infrastructure does not allow me, then I will definitely get injured. So it's not that a certain position in a certain dance form is detrimental. It's about how you use your body to adapt to what you want to achieve. And then it's also the question of the level of perfection you want to achieve, right? Um, so sometimes if your body is structured a certain way, you may not be able to achieve that level of perfection and you have to figure out compensatory techniques to do so um, or adapt the, the movement to to be, you know, to be, to look good on your body, for example. And so, earlier when we were talking, you said something about um, how teaching um, all these things to people of different body structure, uh, it's it's very teacher dependent. It depends a lot on the teacher. How yes, much do you think, like teachers nowadays know about uh, the biomechanics and what should be and should not be taught to a student. You run Arpan Dance Academy in right. CRB. Uh, you have your own students. So how do you incorporate all your knowledge in like your daily teaching? Yeah, I can answer the second part of your question. How do I incorporate my knowledge? I cannot really comment on what other teachers do or what their level of knowledge is. Um, I think generally speaking, it would be really great uh, for teachers in general to know more about anatomy, to know more about physiology, to more, know more about the biomechanics of the body and how it can be adapted for a certain dance form. And that's, um, that's what, exactly what I try to do in class. So if one of my students has a greater cue angle or has knock knees and cannot do the Aramandi really well, I am not going to push that person. I'll tell that person that in the kind of dance form that you have picked, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, the level of excellence is defined by A, B, and C. Your body may not be able to achieve A, B, and C, but it's. I can only tell you, I can only say that don't push for that kind of excellence. But then I make them aware of where their body is different from a so-called perfect body. And I say, okay, this is how your body is structured let's figure out how we can compensate this for you and enable you to do that step. So maybe your turnout at your knee level is not too good. That's fine. Don't push it because then you're creating a torque in your knee and there are, there's a great chance that you may injure your ligaments and cartilages and not be able to dance at all. So I'd rather that they are able to dance even if it's not completely perfect than be injured and not be able to dance. So I work on on my students in terms of figuring out their neutral alignment, making sure they understand where your midline falls, you know, center of gravity has to fall within the base, any movement that you do still has to be there, um, pelvic tilt, making students aware of an anterior pelvic tilt, um, a, a neutral position and a posterior pelvic tilt. You might have noticed a lot of uh, people who dance, they tend to have a very strong anterior pelvic tilt. So it looks like they're sticking their butt out. 
and that's that's not a very efficient position to dance in so you'd rather have you'd rather have a neutral position and in the beginning if you're used to tilting your pelvis and dancing and you ask them to stand straight they find it much harder in the beginning but later on they're like oh this is way more efficient and things like you sit in murumandi you have to get up and do you know in the second tatita when you have to get up and do that people dodder and you know their knees come forward it it's like this whole thing big you know it it sounds just like a very complex thing one of the simple ways of making your tatetam look good when you get up is when you go down in armandi you go down with absolutely neutral position with your back straight and then you have to focus on your core muscles to get up it's not really your quadriceps i mean your quadriceps are involved but as you get up you keep yourself nice and strong focus on your core exhale and hold and just come up halfway through and then don't try to come up in sthanakam and then turn around you know just come up halfway through and kick that leg out and twist at that level so you're increasing efficiency by you know this oh you can't see my hands so this is your bottom you're sitting on the floor instead of coming up and then turning you just come up to a good like a deep aramandi and then kick one leg out that way you're keeping your weight right on top of the static leg the weight bearing leg and your center of gravity is also falling within the base and everything is nice and solid right here as you kick that leg and break them out so those are the things i try to do with my students when i'm teaching them okay so, uh, i think we move on to the first segment uh, that we named as youtube anubhava this uh, joy sakas here uh, we thought uh, we'll play one of uh, leela ka's latest videos i mean it's it's latest on youtube but it's, it's recorded much earlier it's a movie called sanchari that uh, produced by the public diplomacy division uh, from the ministry of external affairs by the government of india uh, we, we picked uh, we picked a couple of segments from uh, her rupa mujuchi varnam first the uh, uh, i think i'll say the trikala jati okay while madana is doing that quick one more question aka <laughs> uh, you learned dance first and then you didn't know much about biomechanics but then later you you know did your research in kalakshetra and stuff so did you alter your own technique yes in retrospect yes i did and i wouldn't say i did my phd in kalakshetra i did my phd in university of delhi right uh, work i went to kalakshetra as well as to bharata kalanjali mm-hmm. and to a couple of other uh, institutions for the control group um yes i did have to change my uh, the way i did few things but not not like i didn't have to make any very big changes because the technique that start in in our style is is already pretty clean um it's just that for my own body i had to make a few changes mm-hmm. yeah. and madana is ready yeah, yeah. ಕಿಟ್ಟಕ್ಕ <laughs> for us it is very uh, rare for us to see a video of her in in her probably what she was in her 30s when this video was shot we we haven't seen many of her videos that were shot at that time so for us it is it's very precious for for me that's how i remember her because um that's the time i learned from her and 
I used to catch a bus and go see her shows or tell my dad to take me. So my memories of her performances are more like what's in this in this movie. I think I also have only seen her in her later stages of her career. I mean, I have this is the first video I saw of her when she is really young and in her prime yes. of being. Uh, not that she is not at a prime right now, but um, I am a big fan of Leela. I think everybody here is yeah, <laughs> definitely yeah, my, yes. So I can tell us something about like your personal bond with Leela Ka and um, how that translated like in her teaching, her personality. How did it show up? And because you have learned from Janardhan and Sir Chandrasekhar Sir and Leela Ka, so um, yes. But she she is the person who took me from Tattadavus all the way to my Arangetram. She she's yes, yes. she's been my teacher from Tattadavus to Arangetrams and beyond, right? Yes. So yes. she is the person. That comes first to my mind when I think of my dancing. She, she is my north star when it comes to dancing. And then later on, I did, you know, learn for a few months here and there with Janardhan and sir and Chandrasekhar sir and and Krishnamurti sir. Um, but um, but yeah, so um, I have really good memories of learning dance in Delhi, um, in Bharatiya Kala Kendra, and then in Gandharva Mahavidyale. Um, and it's, it's it was just a very pleasant, very pleasant and wonderful ride. Um, she was always very subtle, very gentle, you know. Um, not not the historically people talk about teachers who throw tattakadis and things like that. None of that. Very very uh, very gentle, very wonderful. Um, I I thoroughly enjoyed my experience. I'm really glad um, I ended up learning from her when I joined her. I had no idea who she was. I had no idea what dance form I wanted to learn. Um, I was purely inspired by Bhushan Lakhandri on Ram Leela. Uh, when Ram Leela was telecast uh, on DD1 for the first time, I saw Bhushan Lakhandri and some other dancer who played Lakshman. They were they were going to their vanvas and um, on the little black and white TV screen, I saw them enter with you know bow and arrow and everything and. I was like, oh my god, such wonderful dancing. And those people, I think they were trained in Chow probably. And I was very impressed. So when I saw Bharatiya Kala Kendra announcing uh, <clears throat> summer classes for dance, I said, that's where I'm going. Um, and she was, when I went, I joined the Bharatanatyam class there. And uh, when I met her, she was so unassuming and very casual and very like, you know, chilled about everything. It's like, hmm, this is fun. <laughs> So I learned from scratch with her, and it's, it's been it's been it's been great. Yeah, I think she's so. I think that amazes me is she's so light on her feet, but she doesn't uh, feel overbearing. Like it doesn't look like she's being very uh, like disjointed and you know throwing her weight uh, like literally in her foot. Sometimes when dancers dance, they look extra sharp. But Akka is very precise, but in a very uh, understated kind of way. Yes. So, uh, I, I think you have explained it really well. I mean, there's something about about her dancing that I cannot put my finger on. Um, that I'm really all gushy and <laughs> everything about. Um, and it's not just because she's my teacher. Uh, I think a lot of other people also feel the same way. Um, and the only way I think I can describe it is uh, we all learn the grammar uh, of dance. Um, it's like we all learn English in school, but only some of us write well. Um, and from those some of us, only some of us can write poetry. And from those some of us who can write poetry, only some of us can write poetry that touches your heart. So it's the same thing with Akka's dancing. Like we all learn the grammar of dance, but only some people can go that one step ahead and then another step ahead and then another step ahead, you know. Yeah. Even when she teaches in workshops, she insists that we feel every movement of every adava, give life to every movement and, and do it with so much uh, passion. And I love how she did the Taha Tajam how she beautifully reached forward with her hand. This is so beautiful. Yeah, we, yes, and that's exactly how I remember learning Taha Tajam Tarita too, with a lot of body movement and extension and just. Even in a Varnam, when she's teaching some Abhinaya stuff, uh, like um, in Sami Arai Todeva, there is a place where you do this. 
and in that just kind of learning how to use your body um, just to make make that little extra impact. Yeah, I agree with one telling thing. Uh, uh, every moment you have to kind of savor it and then do it, not just uh, doing it just for the sake of like, you know, exactly. okay, this survey has to finish in uh, 30 seconds and I have to finish it as quickly as possible and in the heart. But what about that one? Atami we are doing or that kuluku we are doing, enjoying that and then doing it. That. Yes, which is why I'd rather do a small tirmanam, like a really kuti tirmanam uh, and just do it really, really well with all my heart in it, rather than do like, you know, uh, a, nowadays varnam tirmanams go on for eternity and I, I just don't get it because I just lose track and then I, I don't enjoy it anymore. So I like these old small kuti tirmanams and, you know, people think it's not, I'm not being very innovative and cool, but that's how it is. Yeah, me and Madhana were talking the other day. I think the longest Tirmana I've seen on YouTube is some four and a half minutes long. It's like going on and on and on. While uh, I learned from the Lakshman, Adaya Lakshman sir's choreography and no, none of the Tirmanams are more than one and a half minutes long. Uh, I so think that's, more, that's more than I enough, have no right? tolerance. <laughs> And speaking of Lakshman sir, in this video, the Natuangam is his and it's just oh. so powerful and oh, this Leela Akka's dancing, it's just total package. I just wish there was a little more light in it so we could see the whole thing. I don't know what is with this artistic lighting thing. You end up seeing like pieces of her, but somehow that makes you want to see more. <laughs> Maybe that was the goal. <laughs> Audio is not doing okay. Can you play the okay. next part of the video? Can you see the screen now? Yes. Do you have something to say about Leela Akka's Abhinaya? Um, I know it's the traditional Kalakshetra Abhinaya, but Leela Akka seems to do it in a much less, like sometimes no offense, but sometimes things look very jerky uh, and it seems disconnected, but Akka is so fluid and it's all one piece. I think she like makes it like gel together so well. Right. So, yes, um, I've heard this uh, sort of complaint many times that Kalakshetra dancers or people who follow the Kalakshetra style, their Abhinaya is lacking and that it's very, um, you know, very like predefined and computerized and, you know. <laughs> so I, I think, I think the way we do it is, when you teach when you teach a student how to get into this whole business of abhinaya it's like an acting class right so initially the child or the student is very uncomfortable uh, making faces at nobody and nothing uh, so when you are at an uncomfortable stage it's important to predefine it so that the students can just you know say okay i'm really uncomfortable doing abhinaya this is the first time i'm trying it but if i have a predefined expression to make at least I know I'm getting the baseline right. So I think the goal of the Kalakshetra methodology is to get that baseline going because that's the start. 
Now, what you do with that baseline later on as competent dancers is is completely up to you. And I think that's where you know the the comparison should happen only when that student has made that transition from the baseline to making expression or abhinaya a part of their own personality and and part of their whole you know effort to study the piece understand the poetry get into the whole it's like it's like you know playing uh, playing a character uh, in a film you have to get into that character you hear stories about people going on a diet to get into a certain character or you know people putting on weight to do a certain character we don't do anything we just chill <laughs> our lives go on and then one fine day we just go and dance and we expect to fall into the character kathakali dancers for example when you have um, the kathakali festivals in the temples in kerala they dance for 15 20 days so you are if i'm playing arjuna i'm playing arjuna for 15 20 days so i am in that character i've heard funny stories in kerala about wives complaining about you know how during the kshetram <laughs> festivals the, the characters are you know they behave like that at home too um so i think that's where the criticism comes from um and of course definitely akka is, is is way beyond all of that and even when i had just started learning uh sarasi jakshulu or something simple i remember going and watching her shows and i could never take my eyes off of her so even for somebody who didn't really know much about dance just starting to learn a shabdam she had the power to you know um i mean i honestly could not take my eyes off of her even if i didn't understand the piece so there is something compelling about about her abhinaya which is not overstated but it's very very personal and it's it's very internal it's very personal it's very sensitive and and it represents uh, represents an artist who has you know who has very strongly uh, blended body mind and soul into the concept that she's trying to recreate and that comes through that comes through and that usually doesn't come through with other people that i see so for me that's the defining thing you know and naka quick question so why we are on abhinaya like you teach arpan in um, students in the us and uh, you yourself are like not um, i'm sure when you started doing it uh, learning in delhi it must have been hard to relate to all the tamil telugu and all these yes. foreign <laughs> compositions and yes. more so for students in the us who don't even have indian culture like not even delhi chennai but us india thing so yes. how how challenging is it to do abhinaya to a foreign language or to a foreign culture piece and does it do did you have any personal challenges and do do your students face these and how do you like work through that and yeah quite a bit actually i mean there are your 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 question has answers at multiple levels you know challenges that i went through um i grew up syrian orthodox christian in delhi my parents spoke malayalam at home we went to church um uh, but my friends spoke hindi so i knew malayalam hindi and english um uh, and then i started learning things like sarasi jakshulu and manavi chekona and i was like what what does it mean <laughs> uh, so i had to of course think in hindi or english or malayalam in my head i mean you know we all learn the words of the song and we write the meanings in english and we try to remember all these things um but i started saying sentences in my head for myself and that's how i was able to navigate and then when you keep doing a piece for a while you know you kind of understand the words you 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 blend with it you start blending with the music uh, with the song itself and then it becomes easy you don't have to say those things in your head um teaching here in the us although the kids my students are of indian origin some of them were born and brought up in india too um i think this whole thing about being fascinated with mythology or doing only krishna and shiva items um i don't think the kids are interested in you know doing more than one shabdam or one varnam just for them to get a snapshot of what it is and then beyond that it becomes uh, it, be- it it's no longer challenging for them and it's unfortunately not very relevant to them either so the there is a great push or a desire to do things uh you know that that are more relevant in their lives like you know students want to do poems of pablo neruda for example um and i'm completely cool with it you know um because i i think the grammar of dance 
um, I don't remember the shloka, but Dhananjan sir recently told in the camp that in the in Nati Shastra there is a shloka that says the technique and grammar of dance is meant to be used for anything and everything. It's not just to you know to to pick poems from the bhakti movement or you know from the last three where where dance has been going for the last three hundred years. The Nati Shastra itself says. The technique that that is being prescribed in this book is for everything to describe everything and anything, you know, and we are failing that statement right there by 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 limiting ourselves. So, to answer your question, I am really happy that it's not working out for people here because if it's not working out, I am pushed and challenged to do things outside the normal in quotes normal repertoire, um, and. That's that's really amazing. Like for one of my students, Arangetrams, we did the the initial piece. Um, I picked a Doha, Kabir Doha, Karat Karat Abhyas ke Jadmati Ho to Sojan. It's a very standard thing that we learn as as kids. Um, translating to the fact that as a dancer, if you don't keep practicing, you know, you don't really. It's not just learning a step and doing it. You just have to do it till you get bored to your bones doing it, and then when your boredom is like you can't bear it at that point you go beyond it and that's when it starts shining right and then you can shine it a little bit more so we did a piece um, that shows a little kid who sees a youtube video of of a dance and she says oh this is very cool so i have her looking at a screen typing on the keyboard you know world wide web mouse and everything and she's watching a video and then she goes and tries to you know emulate the dance and then she realizes she needs a teacher to learn yadi yadi ya all of that stuff so um so you make up pieces as and when your uh, you know your situation so requires or demands and the technique and grammar that we have through natya shastra abhinay darpana all of them is just extremely powerful so it it it's a waste to limit it to just doing a few few kinds of things i think it should it should be as a language it should be used to explore anything and everything so aga i have a question for you um so you had learned in delhi and then in uh, kalakshetra uh, so i didn't really i mean i i went there for my thesis uh, for for data collection um so i was never really a student at kalakshetra but um after standing outside rajaram sir's office for 3 days he let me dance <laughs> from 9 to 5 uh, because i could work on i could work on my subjects um my giddy pigs uh, only after 5 o'clock so i wouldn't really say that i studied in courts at kalakshetra but um i was permitted to to dance there from 9 to 5 the duration of my field work Okay, but but still, but uh, within the environs of Kalakshetra. Yes. Uh, so, how did you feel uh, like learning in Delhi and then like being in Kalakshetra or learning from in Kalakshetra? I think the difference is is very palpable in the atmosphere of the institute itself. I mean, everybody there is there because they have committed the next four years of their life. like you do to med school or you do to undergrad school right you're you're committed to doing that and from 7 in the morning to 5 in the evening that's that's all you do in delhi i was a part time student i was never a full time student at bharatiya kala kendra so i would go to you know my college to the university and then i would attend classes with leela aka on i think it was tuesdays thursdays and saturdays so you would go for an hour 3 days a week so that's very different because you have a life going on and then you go for an hour to learn something and you come back versus being in a place where you we just thinking of dance and you're surrounded by dancers who are revising stuff even while they are having lunch or you know you're bicycling back to your house as you're still talking about some core way that you learned that's a very different feel you're constantly bombarded by knowledge and half the times you don't even absorb 100% of it you know mm -hmm. i think a lot of it just comes and goes and later on you think oh my god if i were like a 100% absorbable sponge i would have been so much better off at this point you know so i think that's the biggest difference um okay 
Raghu, do we want to do your segment now? Um, the one on dance history. Okay, so let me. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, so today I want to uh, show something very interesting stuff about uh, dance notations or uh, inscriptions related to dance from the 4th century. So let's see what we can understand. Uh, this is a grid just to give you a basic information and then I'll let you deduce or uh, try deciphering it. So this is a grid and then it is kind of like a, a palindrome. So can someone uh, read the grid which I have shown on the right side? Is that what it is? Yeah, that's in the first line. So if you read it the other way uh, from right to left also, it's the same. So, and also the up to down. Ta, tai, ta, tai, ta. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the diagram. Yeah, yeah. So this is a inscription in stone? Yes, this is an inscription in stone, and uh, this is this inscription can be seen even today. Oh, where yeah, is it? <laughs> so this is in a place called Archalu in Iro district, and uh, there is this very small town called Archalu, and uh, that is this cave, and in which this inscription is uh, present. Uh -huh. So. So you want okay, to ask the next, my next question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So basically, all inscriptions have an author who made it for what and for what purpose. So this is the inscription that goes on top of it that says uh, a particular person from a particular community made the following inscription. So his name is. Devan Satan and he belongs to the community Malai Vanakkan. So the inscription says Iduthum Punarathan Malai Vanakkan Devan Satan. So a person called Devan Satan belonging to the clan or community of Malai Vanakkan composed these following lines. And uh, based on the epigraphical evidences, that is, uh, in other words, the way the Letters were evolved in time. We can safely place this in the fourth century AD. So this is before Silapadigaram. Silapadigaram was sometime around sixth century. Oh. So, so that this becomes more important. That usually we think Silapadigaram is the earliest recorded evidence in uh, recent times. But then there is much much uh, evidences beyond that period as well. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, Rahu, yeah. I have a question. How does it say that this notation was for dance or for music? How do you know? How are you sure that this uh, inscription has something to do with dance? Uh, the reason we think is, although it doesn't say specifically that these are dance notations uh, or musical notations, between uh, but this script is called Tamil Brahmi script. And among mm -hmm. all the Tamil Brahmi inscriptions that have been documented so far, only this particular inscription has uh, uh, the solus which are currently used also, like ta, tai, right? So, yeah. so that it was kind of like a both, and people were kind of more intrigued about not just documenting the musical notations but also. Uh, like making it kind of like introducing uh, a map, a rhythm or a mathematical format in the sense of a grid and a palindrome. So these these concepts are like pretty uh, new, pretty okay to us because we know them. But for a fourth century person, I think this is like a pretty complex uh, inscription for them. It's in another grid. We didn't see this one before. Yeah. So this is this grid is on the. Uh, these two grids are side by side on the same rock and uh, this is the second grid uh, and some of the letters have vanished over time, disappeared over time. But we still can make, make out what the other letters were because it was a palindrome. So we know the 
we we see the top line and then from top to bottom and based on that the other letters that have been deduced are put in brackets so someone can probably um, go ahead and read like madan i will read <laughs> um, so it's 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 kai kai ta tai ta kai yeah, yeah correct correct okay, okay. so the as in the earlier grid the uh, this is a palindrome and as well as the the right to left or left to right and top to bottom are all the same yeah no it's pretty cool yeah so it's a sudoku for solicitors <laughs> <laughs> probably they were they were they had lot of time and they thought a lot about this a <laughs> <laughs> lot of time yeah no tv <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> or internet for that matter exactly <laughs> they didn't know how to communicate probably just with it <laughs> awesome so is that all yeah that's that's what i have for today thank cool. you dagu that was uh, very informative i didn't know that there was anything before selapadigaram <laughs> for that matter yeah. um um ragu where, where do you pick this information from so there is this uh, epigraphist or the person who uh, uh, he is also an archaeologist and he wrote his magnum opus book uh, uh, on the tamil brahmi inscriptions his name is airavadam mahadevan even and uh, he actually uh, is also known famous for deciphering the indus valley civilization hieroglyphics Okay. so but not much has been uh, come out of it but there has been a lot of controversy about what what the hieroglyphics mean but still uh, this this particular uh, book is like a thousand page book uh, published in harvard oriental series and uh, it has all the tamil brahmi inscriptions right from second century bc to fourth century or like fifth century ad and uh, he, he actually talks about how the current tamil language uh, evolved from tamil brahmi and how those tamil brahmi itself evolved from brahmi language the script script okay so so this, we go to our last segment um uh, this is uh, to know a little bit about joy sakas dance preferences and personality so i'll shoot some random uh, questions in a rapid fire fashion and you shouldn't take a lot of time to say whatever comes to your mind first when i say like the following things um are you ready akka is it a one word answer or a one sentence answer it can be up to a sentence but up you should take a lot thank you very yeah. much but <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't take a lot of time to think it's like i want your instinctive reaction sort of thing and you'll edit the video right <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not um okay. uh what uh, what comes to your mind when i say the following things dance critics necessity okay december season no idea i'm a delhiite Okay. Bharatanatyam <laughs> factories uh, should be outsourced to China. Bharatanatyam <laughs> <laughs> competitions. I don't believe in them. Couples in dancing. They look great. Okay. U.S. tours and workshops. Huh. Hmm. They were good. Okay. Um, Bharatanatyam in the U.S. Um, is is doing well. Okay. okay. Love it. Abhinaya. Love it even more. <laughs> okay, your favorite Barney. That's hardly a question, Kalakshetra. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then your second favorite Barney. Um, style. Style. Odissi and Mohini Atam. Okay. Okay. Not um, a Barney, but a different art form. Sure. Um. fashion or a trend in bharatanatyam these days that you like um the creative use of costumes okay something okay. that you don't like the creative use non creative use of costumes <laughs> so the same old costumes so. um, no no I mean, uh, something that i don't like is super long tirmanams and um 
you know crowd crowd pleasing dance which has become essential but uh, mm-hmm. i just don't enjoy it that much shringara aur bhakti say that again shringara aur bhakti both mm. your role model of course leela <laughs> <laughs> okay your favorite contemporary soloist um if it's contemporary dance it's astad debu Okay. okay. Uh, or did you mean in Bharatanatyam? In Bharatanatyam as well. Why not? Um, I don't have a specific favorite. I mean, outside of Leela Ka, but I do okay. enjoy watching Priya Darshini Govind's performances. Yay! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, she's amazing. She's... According to you, an underrated dancer. <laughs> underrated dancer. Lot the actually there are lots of dancers who are underrated who people don't know, don't even know about. Um, um, okay, and an overrated dancer. Again, there are lots. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what do you think, or what do you say to people, or what do people actually mean when they say the following things? Um, the audience today has no respect for dance or patience for dance, classical dance. it depends on where you are but mostly um, here around in the us it's true um margam is dead not really okay, okay. government is not doing enough for classical arts um i think they are doing quite which government are you talking about <laughs> india or us <laughs> in the in the us i think it's kind of straight forward to get a grant and get things going yeah i mean if you have a grant you apply for it if you get it great i mean generally speaking with the economy i don't think there's enough money for the arts anyways yeah uh, so it is a little hard okay and uh, sabhas are not doing enough for young dancers i i i don't know i mean why are we dependent on sabhas Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Akka. This was my first trial for rapid fire, <laughs> and you get full marks from my side because you say oh. Govinda and Leela Samson. <laughs> okay. Uh, after this fun segment, I want to talk, um, have more fun, like maybe debating and discussing a topic which is on minds of a lot of people. Uh, do we really need an arangetram, and what it really stands for in today's context? People spend a lot of money on arangetrams, um, which is their right. If some people want to, they can celebrate as lavishly as they want. But to expect the same of everyone, the peer pressure of doing it, and professional sabhas actually holding it as a standard and is it really a standard uh, to judge people on um what do you think Let's start with madana yeah um i i think it's yeah like you said it's one's own personal preference to do an arangetram or not to do it but uh, what bothers me is the quality uh, some teachers they they keep time as a measure they say uh, after 3 or Four years, irrespective of how well the dancer is doing, they they try and uh, push her on stage, uh, make her do an arangetram. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think it's right. And also, there are a few people who try and make money from arangetrams. They they cha they they get extra fees for uh, uh, arranging an arangetram and all that, which which is which is quite painful and uh, and I I really don't support that. So. I think uh, arangetram should be more of an instrument, uh, and it should be the quality of dancing that should be put forward more than the show and the with all the pomp and show it is now. So, do you think we need arangetram or not? Final word. Um. Yes. Yes, we need arangetram. Yeah, but at maybe scale it down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Raghu, what do you think? Yeah. So. Uh, I think I agree to completely with what Madana said that Arangetram has to be a more uh, like scaled down event and not to have a lavish extravagance and all these demands and all those things. But uh, to your question, I think Arangetrams are necessary as long as they are intimate and uh, within a small space and within the feasibility of the student and. Not based on the demands of the teacher. Okay. 
Joy Sarkar, you have been a student, you are now a teacher. Uh, did you have fun at your Arangetram and does it really add value to you as a dancer to go through that process? I think it's a very complicated um, scenario, situation, concept, everything. Um, I think an Arangetram is a very personal thing between a teacher and a student. And uh, most people talk of Arangetram from the student's perspective. And the teacher is almost like a peripheral person who's like either forcing them to do it or not forcing them to do it or whatever. Um, I look at it a little differently. I think it's mm -hmm. both of us. Um, it's my work too. So my student is my work too. And for the student, it's it's his or her um, years of training in a certain art form. So it's it's almost like it's almost like a painting that both of us are making together. You know, I draw a few strokes, then my student draws a few strokes. I make a few corrections, and then we create this painting over the years, right? We we both work on it. So the the net result, the the thing that we end up painting after ten years or whatever is a fruit of both our labors. And if I were a painter and somebody said, would you like to do an exhibition of your paintings? I would say, yeah, I do want to do a paint, you know, exhibition of my paintings. But it's not just me, it's the two of us. And it's up to us whether that painting remains in the confines of our house, or we put it up on a stage somewhere, or we you know, book the Smithsonian to do our exhibition. Um, <laughs> It's completely your choice, but I think both parties should should feel the desire to present that painting. You know, if if one party does not feel the desire to present that, that the result of their combined work, um, I think then there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And this whole business of spending a lot of money again, like uh, Shubha said, it's your choice. If you have money and you want to have a big wedding, um, then yeah, go for it. But nobody should be forced, forced to you know, meet a certain financial ability to be able to dance. My ability to dance as a student or to do my arangetram is reflected in my ability as a dancer and my teacher's confidence in me as a dancer. It, it does not depend on how rich I am or how poor I am or which theater I can afford or whatever. So if that is the case, I'm happy to do an Arangetram in my home studio and call like five people and it should be okay. That, that's what I believe. And if somebody wants to book the Smithsonian, that's fine by me too. Either way. Yeah, but Akka, dance is kind of a expensive profession that even if you want to put out the you know, the most uh, basic concert, you still have to pay the musicians because they are professional people who are coming and playing for your performance. You still have to uh, pay the teacher uh, for that, that is tradition and etc. Um, so yeah, and I can, I can give you a really wonderful example of my own Arangetram. I think when I was ready for an Arangetram, um, I'm from a very regular middle class family. My father was an editor, my mom was a nurse. And at that point, we just didn't have enough money to do, you know, a big Arangetram in Delhi or call the press and have a cocktail party. Those were the things that used to happen in those days. And I spoke to Leelaka about it and she said, you know what, you, you really don't have to do any of that stuff. And to answer your question about uh, musicians, um, she she offered and she said, you know, just, um, I'll talk to the musicians, you don't have to pay them Arangetram rates, you can pay them regular rates, and whatever is missing, I mean, they deserve to be paid Arangetram rates, right? So whatever is missing, I'll compensate. So Leela Akka herself, you know, took it upon herself to compensate the musicians for my Arangetram, because I didn't have the ability to do it at that point. And that's something, you know, I can never forget that. It, it's it's something I'll never ever forget, even if I forget, you know, items that I did for my Arangetram. Um, we booked a very simple auditorium. We printed cards that were like 25 paisa or something. And a friend, you know, a friend's friend had a printing company or something and he did that. Um, no videos, no photos, no nothing. Um, and the only sort of chief guest I had was the bishop, the metropolitan of the Syrian Orthodox Church in Delhi because he was one person who encouraged me to, 
you know, there was this whole thing about you being a Christian and all of that. And he was one person who encouraged me and said, you know, an art form is an art form. And, you know, uh, I don't think Jesus will be mad at you for <laughs> doing this kind of thing. So he really encouraged me. And so I wanted him to be there for my Arangetram. And I think one of the few pictures I have is of Tirumeni, uh, His Grace, Dr. Paulus Mar Gregorius and Leelaka and my parents. And that's a very intimate thing for me, right? So she set an example by, uh, you know, by making my Arangetram as financially easy for me as possible. And and most memorable. Most memorable, and I'm I'm happy to do the same thing for my students, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But like uh, Madana was saying, that uh, there's a lot of uh, demand and push and pull happening when it comes to an arangetram. Like, yes. A uh, lot of teachers say, uh, "You have to keep this much money. I need a sari. I need a ring." You know, I have heard about that. I have heard about gurus in India having very specific requirements about how many grams of gold they should be yeah. offered. Um, I'm not clear why. <laughs> it just sounds kind of odd. Um, I would never be able to do that. But the only logical explanation I can find is that, you know, maybe they take, they teach. Uh, so when a child is ready for Arangetram, you have to come for private lessons to work only on you, right? You're not doing group lessons. So maybe in those days, in the Purana Zamana, they didn't charge for private lessons for their time or something. And then, you know, when you train the child separately for a year, maybe at the end of the year, you're just billing for, you know, backlog billing or something. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, I uh, Honestly, I'm trying to find a logical explanation for it. And that's the it, only... Yeah, it, it's, it's more logically said as uh, Guru Dakshina. So, like for example, the mythology where uh, Ekalavya and Dronacharya, Dronacharya finally asked, okay, you learnt it uh, in absentia, I didn't teach you, but I need my Guru Dakshina, so give me your thumb. So well, Yeah, but Guru Dakshina was probably, like I said, nowadays there is a concept of paying tuition, right? You pay fees for a class. I don't think in those days everybody would come to class and pay tuition. That's why a Guru Dakshina was important. Because you're staying with somebody and learning an art form, not paying quarterly fees or annual fees or anything. And at the end of it, you honor the person by giving something substantial like gold. But in today's zamana, you know, I have students who come and ask me, what's my value, value for money? You know, I pay so many dollars for a one hour <laughs> class. I didn't learn a new step. I've had somebody ask me that. Wow. Like, <laughs> there's no bank. No, somebody actually wrote me email saying there's no bank for the buck because you didn't teach me a new step. Yeah, I think in the US they kind of treat it as a service, like you're providing a service. So if I pay you, I expect a certain thing. So there is no that guru is is very revered. I shouldn't raise my voice. I shouldn't question him at all. All that sentiment of reverence is a little out of the window here. It's it's a very logical transaction. I give you something, you have to give something back, and that something has to something. It can't be like, like I I don't know my steps, so my guru may do the same step. That doesn't count. As yeah, I mean, if you need the bank for the buck, you need to work that one week. I mean, you see me on Sunday or Monday. I teach you something. If you want your bank for the buck for the next Sunday, you better rehearse. I mean, you better practice you know, until you have it perfect, then you'll get more than a bang for your work. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so basically, Arangetram, earlier days, people used to do it to show that what they used to be their first stage performance ever. So that makes sense to me. But nowadays, students, they are on stage, like, my daughter is going to dance in Telugu Association, Tamil Association, this association. They are on stage even before they are finished learning their adavus. So that's not their first time on the stage. Then what is the relevance of a so-called Arangetram in today's I think the relevance is if I'm doing something for a Diwali program or something, I'm probably doing few adavus or maybe Alaripu and I'm doing it with five or six other kids. The from my perspective, the whole idea of an Arangetram is the teacher is saying, I have worked to impart a certain set of principles, technique, methodology, theory, knowledge, etc., etc., to the student. And I think the student is capable of presenting it, you know, 
presenting it for in front of an audience with live orchestra. See, dancing with live orchestra is also very hard when you you know if you haven't done it before. It's a brand new experience. Um, so it's the capability of the child to dance with musicians with live with a live orchestra and to dance for an entire hour and a half on his or her own steam, which they would not have done by doing Diwali program and Onam program and this and that. So just the pressure of having to do an hour and a half of a, or of a full margam or a pseudo margam or whatever they are doing, that itself is a challenge, you know, having the you are the sinosure of everything that day if you fail the entire thing flops that kind of pressure can you handle that pressure it does your memory stay with you during that time are you able to make a change if you goof up and the musicians change can you make a change so you're testing the child for all of those things and you're saying as a teacher i believe he or she is ready for it I think that's the difference. I I think uh, from both the teacher and the student, we need to uh, they they both need to set like certain um, things like you know the teachers cannot accept the demands of the parents saying oh she has been learning for five six years when are you having a running at them. Or the teacher is like, uh, you know, saying, oh, you know what, I have done 15 Arangate drums so far. I want one more feather on my cap. Uh, you know, I want to do five more Arangate drums this year and your kid is, is in the line. So, you know, pressure from both sides. And ultimately, the kid suffers. Well, I, I think as a teacher, your goal is to not to bow down to such pressures. Because the moment I put a student out there, I am representing myself, I am representing Leelaka, I am representing all the people I learnt from, I am representing the Kalakshetra style or tradition. So it's my job to make sure that anybody I present as an Arangetram candidate at least meets the minimum bar because Arangetram is not saying you are excellent. Arangetram is merely saying you can do X, Y and Z to this level of competence. So I think it's your job as a teacher to, I mean, I have told parents that they're welcome to go to other teachers. I'm, I'm not willing to, I'm not, I'm just not willing to do it. And like uh, Shubha said, right, everybody asks her, oh, have you done your Arangetram? That's like, you know, the minimum bar in your bio data. Um, Is it that's a fair bar to have? Um, well, people ask me as a teacher, if they want to assess me as a teacher, they'll say, the parents will come and ask me, how many Arangetrams have you done? Have I'll be like, uh, the uh, zero, <laughs> one, two, uh, and, and the immediate reaction is, oh, she she's probably not a good teacher, and I'm okay with that. They are welcome to go somewhere else. <laughs> Anyone who wants to judge on that, it's better to not be with them kind of a team. Uh, exactly, but, exactly. Which I mean, it's just creating awareness, right? You, I can either spend time and create awareness and say, look, my ability is not reflected by the number of Arangetrams I do. Similarly, your child's ability is not reflected by the by when she did her Arangetram. There's nothing that an audition cannot fix, you know, to answer your earlier question. How do you know whether the person applying for a Sabha thingy is, is good or not? I must have been good 15 years ago. I'm not good now. So I may have an Arangetram and various Kalaima, Mani, various, various, whatever those awards are called. I may have that in my resume, but as of today, my dancing probably sucks. So would you take me because I have all those credentials? You shouldn't take yeah, me. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> no, you shouldn't take me. <laughs> yeah, well, and the other thing about true. Arangetrams I've seen is, uh, Sadid, will you saying something? No, I said the converse is also true. That's all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In, in India, Arangetram marked the entry of a dancer into the uh, you know arena of being able to perform. Nowadays, at least now in the US that I see, people do their Arangetrams to kind of finish off their training with their teacher and move on to college and then never dance again. And yeah. then about 90% of the Arangetrams, which is fine if the parents and teachers want to celebrate that the kid has learned and become one with Indian culture, which is kind of uh, why most <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, the number of people who continue dancing after Arangetram is very less, at least in the US. 
so the whole purpose of arangetram has now like become it to mark the end of whatever i have learned and then i'm never going to learn again so then the whole question of when i have done my arangetram and what am i doing after it and then is there any relevance to that in between is a little lost to me and that's why i don't get the concept i know a lot of people are opposed to arangetram on principle i am <laughs> not a post but i just don't see it being very relevant today some people also look at it as a point to start teaching they say once they done the arangetram they can become gurus themselves and oh i know people who have started teaching since they were 16 <laughs> and they have it on their resume a very proud fact and i have been learning for about 20 years and i still don't think i know enough to teach like teachers i have learned from they know so much and compared to them i know so little that i am you know hesitant to even call myself a guru and people have like guru on their resume started this academy at the age of 16 i'm like okay <laughs> well so, i think i think in arangetram is it can actually be a very beautiful and very emotionally satisfying event like um you know my my first arangetram was this child who i've been teaching since the age of 5 and a half or 6 and she did her arangetram at 13 um it was almost like i'm her second mommy and she's graduated or done something great it's a very emotional thing right you see a little kid and now the kid is all grown up and doing all grown up stuff and you know able to carry on a full program on her own it's it's very heartening it's it's um, it's very emotional it's very heartening for the teacher i'm not sure if it's equally emotional for the student but um there there's a lot of beauty in it you know uh, that that we should also talk about and also appreciate there is a sense of accomplishment a sense of you know um i don't know it, it's very hard to explain i mean i cry after arangetrams and things like that it's just i just get very emotional and i'm a bumbling idiot at the end of it but uh, <laughs> but so, i think i think once the concept of money comes into all this this whole achievement and then everything goes off you know like yeah. well if you if you graduate from harvard you pay a whole lot of tuition fees don't you <laughs> So why don't we complain about that? I mean, I have a Harvard degree, but I paid so much. I paid like sixty thousand dollars, right? Yeah. You but, should think of it that way too. Yeah. Sometimes you also have to pay a graduation fee to walk down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then you have to rent your cape. I had to rent my PhD convocation, like the cape and the thing. I had to actually pay money to just rent that thing and wear it. Um, yeah. So it's like buying a costume or renting a costume. I mean. Yeah, but here it's like even after you get the graduation, it says inside this is not your original degree until unless you finish all the credits, <laughs> you are not getting <laughs> it. Okay, awesome. We have almost had an awesome session, and as always, we had an awesome time with you. Yeah, uh, to all Good our thank you so much. To all our viewers, I want them nice to looking at Leela Ka's videos and listening. from uh, from joy saka about her thank you so much for uh, being a it part of my, it was my pleasure and my honor thank you for including me in this informal hangout <laughs> hangout chat session yeah thank you, I, thank you i want to ask all of our viewers to check out joy saka's rendition of manavi chekona that's on you oh my god <laughs> <laughs> probably we should put the video link uh, when we put it in the blog Yeah, if you type Shankara Varnam Akka's video is one of the top hits, and it's a delight to watch it. And then you can you fall in love with Akka just like we did. So thank you so much. <laughs> This is my internet fan club. <laughs> yes, we are proudly so. Okay, thank you, Akka. Um, That's. that's that's very sweet of you that's very kind of you it it's it's been really fun knowing you over over facebook and on the web thank you for inviting me to this session and i look forward to helping you guys out for other sessions too we will surely be having you in the future <laughs> no you don't have to invite me as a guest i can be in the background and <laughs> comment and give you give you give you possibilities of you know what needs to be discussed and things like that very that's cool. what i meant <laughs> <laughs> 